Hello and welcome to Ensuring Success, or welcome back to Ensuring Success if you've been with us already today. Um, I have one really quick request. If you've been here earlier and your screen has been on and you didn't refresh your screen during the last session, we would like you to refresh at this point. If you're just joining us now, you don't have to worry about that, but just a really quick screen refresh. And uh, so we're gonna be gone for like three seconds while you do that. So please refresh now if you've been with us earlier. Okay, and now, so welcome all of you. Um, we are Ensuring Success and we're here live in Dallas, Texas at AMS Pictures. And I'm Gail Perry, Editor-in-Chief of CPA Practice Advisor Magazine. And today, uh, we have had five sessions so far. We have five more to go, so we're right at our midway point. And this particular session is called Pain Points Found in Prep, Comp, and Review Services. So we're guessing you already know what pain, those pain points are, and we're going to talk about them today. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsors who are making this event possible for us. And that includes Intuit ProConnect, Peisner Johnson, Receipt Bank, Sage, Zero, Avalara, Boomer Consulting, Canopy, eFile for biz.com and cpa.com. And in particular, we'd like to thank cpa.com for sponsoring this particular session. So uh, with that, um, I need to give you just a quick intro on how to uh, acquire your CPE for this session if you are just joining us now. So uh, what we do is we post three codes at the bottom of the screen throughout the session, three different times. So I will give a shout out to when a code is appearing at the bottom of your screen so you can make a note of it. You need to record it. It's a three digit number. And so there'll be three of those. So all together, nine digits. And at the end of the day, when you're finished watching all of the sessions, you'll go to the menu at the very top of the screen. There's an option for get your CE slash CPE credit and click on that and you'll see a list of all of today's sessions and you can enter the codes you recorded for every session you attended and you'll be able to get your CPE certificates right there. So uh, finally, I'd just like to uh, introduce our speakers for this session. I'm going to introduce them by name and then let each of them uh, tell you a little bit about themselves. So next to me, I have Carl Peterson, and then Matt Towers, and then Greg LaFollette. So please introduce yourselves, gentlemen. Thank you, Gail. <clears throat> I'm Carl Peterson, Vice President of Small Firm Interest for the AICPA. And in that role, I'm really the voice of small and medium-sized firms advocating back to the AICPA and the organization the issues that firms are dealing with today and uh, making sure that we're you know, on top of that and, and we're doing the things that we need to do to help you be successful in the future. And I'm also on the PCPS team. Excellent. I'm Matt Towers. I'm product marketing manager with CPA.com. Um, in that role, I uh, work with firms, better understand um, a bit more about how the profession is um, uh, working through assurance uh, services. And so my responsibilities are over assurance services, understanding uh, that, and uh, just ensuring that we are um, hitting the mark as it relates to assurance services. Hi, I'm Greg LaFollette. I am a CPA. I practiced for 23 years in a large local firm in South Dakota. Um, I've done way beyond my share, I think, of, of uh, comps and reviews, so this is something I care about a lot. Uh, I did. I left practice back in the late 90s and went off, joined Thompson, helped them run one of their software companies, uh, took an early retirement from there. I was... Uh, executive editor of what was then the CPA Software News, and Gail now does a much better job of, of the, the newly reinvented magazine, um, left there and consulted primarily with the vendor community that serves the profession. And about 10 years ago, I went to work for one of my clients, that being CPA.com. Uh, I retired from the executive team. You see there's a pattern here. I retired from the executive team five years ago, and I, uh, they stuck around. I serve as a strategic advisor to the CEO at CPA.com. All right, excellent. So before we start, I'm just going to read the little description that came with the, the, uh, the session when we posted this on our Ensuring Success site, just to set the stage for what we're going to be talking about. So ensuring compliance of your prep comp and review services can often be time intensive. 
Many firms rely on manual processes for organizing data and spend extra time determining which procedures to apply. Communicating with clients and gathering necessary information can also present a challenge without an effective way to collaborate. So during this session, we will discuss strategies to address these challenges and improve the quality of your engagements. So first, what I'm hoping you guys will do is talk about what the old way is, the manual processes, the way we've sort of been doing audit, uh, prep, comp, and review services uh, in the past. You're the oldest, Greg. <laughs> I'm sorry. By, by far, it always happens that way. So I, I, as I think about that, the, the, the first thing that that we should be doing in a, um, a prep or a comp or a review is the whole issue of client acceptance. I don't know that as a rule the profession does particularly good job at the you know at this level in formally doing that. So that's the first thing. The next thing is planning, and I think in an awful lot of cases the planning is when the partner in charge of that engagement gets the box of information, they plan on whose desk it's going to fall on, and that's the, that's the extent, not all of the extent, but that's when the planning begins, and that's really, really too late. So you got you know, the acceptance, the planning, then the actual execution of the, of the project, and that includes all the interaction with the clients, which is painful, whether it's trying to make them use a portal or email or chasing them around, all of that stuff. Um, and then finally, the, the generation of financial statements and the creation of you know, appropriate disclosures and all of those things. So there are, there are huge potholes in each of those places. And um, so I think we're going to end up talking about all of those. Right, right. And you know how it really works is that it's nice to think that we have these client acceptance procedures that all the firms are using, but a lot of small and medium-sized firms, you ultimately take uh, whatever was done last year, right, and that's the procedure for the, for the new year, and you might even take and, and say, okay, here's the checklist we used for the last compilation we did last month for a different client. So we're not always walking through the processes as efficiently and, and methodically as we should yeah, all the time. You can pretty well guarantee <clears throat> that if, if I'm a junior, and I look at last year's work papers for a project, and there are 28 work papers, I can absolutely guarantee you that there will be at least 28 work papers this year. Right. Oh, absolutely. Probably more because I want to do a better job, which is actually a problem, right, Matt? Yeah, it is a problem. You know, um, firms, I think they... They take the, the mentality of, well, we want to make sure that we get all of this stuff done, that we're in compliance, that we are um, doing a great job. And the unfortunate, I guess, side effect of that is that a lot of these engagements just end up really getting overworked. And, it's, and the problem isn't just with um, efficiency as a result of that. The problems can extend beyond that, too. Yeah, yeah. But I think if you think about the old style, right, you know, like, like you mentioned before, Greg, you take the work papers from the prior year, and, and where's the training that's happening for that particular individual, the new staff person, the young staff person? And so the, the, we always have those issues. And what happens is we do a lot of these compilations and reviews at the end of the year. You're now getting into tax season. You're in a small practice, small firm practice, and, and you've got a lot of work to do. Right. You don't have time to train them, so that's a big pain point for yeah. Well, we've, got these, we've got these multiple things going. Number one, you've got all this time thing. Number two, you've got the, the pressure of, I mean, I want to pass peer review. I don't want this, I don't want my job to get selected for peer review and for them, you know, to, to, have, to have notes on the project that I worked on. Right. So I'm going to make sure that, I'm, that I do everything that I've, you know, that I've done. And we've been having conversations with people about a concern that, that I've had, and that is if, if, I, I, if I'm doing a comp and I'm starting to overwork things. I mean, if you, basically, a compilation is we looked at the financial statements, and, you know, but, but I want to do a really good job, so I begin to, to tie out accounts receivable, which actually becomes a little bit more than that. It starts to look like maybe I've verified accounts receivable. And then, um, you know, I've got, well, I tie out, I do a little bit extra work on inventory, and now I've done things that are beyond compilations, my engagement letter says a compilation, but what 
maybe if I get in a court of law, what I might <clears throat> find out is that what I did was a really crappy review, or worse than that, a really crappy audit. Right, right, right. You know, and you think about, um, you know, assurance services, right? An audit might be out here towards the goal line, right? Maybe or there's 85% assurance, you know, a review somewhere else. And we wonder why when we do things like that, an over auditing, overworking right. uh, compilation or preparation even right. today, we wonder why the, the, the expectations and, and lenders have, they're putting that assurance out there and it should really be back to zero. Yep, and we as a profession have to remember that while we consider the word audit to be a term of art, it is not a term of art in the lender community, in the, in the legal community, in, in all the rest of those people. The, the product that comes out is generically referred to as an audit, right. which is horrible. We all jump up and down and say, don't do that. It doesn't help. Right, right, right. And it, we haven't even really, I'm sorry, Matt. I was just going to say, one of the things that really magnifies this issue is you have a lot of firms out there that are, they're more tax driven, they're more kind of tax compliance, but as part of that service offering for a lot of their business clients, they also offer a compilation. And in many cases, they are only looking at this stuff once a year. So they're kind of getting themselves uh, around and ready. And just to some extent, that, I think that contributes to the problem is that they're, they're not doing this all the time necessarily and they're more tax focused and so they, you know, they end up overworking things. I remember many, many, many years ago when a, a brand new concept product came on the market called Accountant's Trial Balance, ATB. People still use it. Yeah, uh, right, exactly. Yeah, it's, it still wants support. It's, it's hard to run it. You have to run it in a DOS emulator. Right. But uh, um, when that product came along, we said, oh my gosh, we've got, we have an automated trial balance and we can make adjusting journal entries and, you know, and, and we've got this amazing tool Essentially, what we have today is still that. Mm -hmm. um, we now have very sophisticated products at the other end, on the audit end, we have, you know, we have Caseware, we have ProSystem FX um, engagement, we have um, Thompson um, engagement CS, you know, and, and other products, very sophisticated, excellent uh, binder products for audits and many firms go, okay, this is our platform that we're gonna do financial statement engagements with, and so we take that very sophisticated product and move it down here, right. which again causes us to overwork and, and adds a level of complexity that shouldn't exist at all. Right. Well, it, it, it makes sense that people would, would do that in some regards because, hey, I have this system, it has a trial balance, right. it helps manage work papers. But when you really think about what's, what's the difference between what you have to do to complete an audit compared to what you have to do to complete a review, I mean, it's, or even a compilation, it's really pretty significant in difference. And, you know, we, this started out, Gail, with you asking kind of what's the old way. Well, with audit, when we kind of see what firms are doing today, it's integrated process to some extent, but you still, at least I still see a lot of, I've got my uh, guidance in one system here, I'm using uh, an Excel list for PBC documents and I email that off and then I've got my trial balance over here, everything's disconnected and it just creates way more work. And that just brings up the whole communication piece with the client, right? right. And how inefficient it is under the old way to communicate the needs that you have, the PBCs, and all those requests. And we haven't even talked about reviews. Right, and when, when, we, when we think about the, this level of complexity in, and I mean, those engagement products are wonderful products, and they've, they've done great things for the, for the profession, but when I talk to a firm that's using those for compilations, and I kind of go, you know, it's the, the F14 is an amazing machine. But if I just need to run down to the corner store to get a quart of milk, my bicycle is a much better machine. Yeah. You know, and and that's, that's kind of where we're stuck there. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it's, uh, it's one of those situations where um, the, the firm, you know, in, in, in talking to, to firms of different sizes, um, there are different, I guess, challenges that result from this. Um, so with a small firm, for instance, um, sole proprietor even, it's really um, driven off of peer review. Like a, a lot of it is driven off. I want to make sure I pass peer review. But when you get into a larger, mid-size or, or larger firm, um, a lot of what's really driving things is what am I cleaning up 
when it gets to the review process internally. So what are newer staff, younger staff doing in the process and uh, how, how, how much do they, how many guardrails do they have around the process, if you will? And uh, the unfortunate reality is the audit side is way further beyond. When you look at um, smart practice aids and, and products like that, there's, uh, there's risk assessment and then a lot of the procedural stuff is kind of follows through with the questions. Where is something like that for prep, comp, and review work? Where is a similar guided process or maybe even better guided process for that? Still right. exists in analog form. That's true. Right. Right. How, yeah. how, right. many, how many of you are practicing have done what I certainly have done and I know you've done is you flip the page, you write N-A, N-A, N-A. No. N-A no. you know, and have you seen my work papers? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, that's what that's, happens. That's, that's, that's what exactly. we do because we haven't we haven't figured out um, in, until now. Um, nobody has put the time in to generate, you know, to, to use technology to to make those intelligent decisions at a technological basis rather than at an analog basis. Right. So often when you're doing that checklist approach like that, and you are, we, I, I would do the same thing. I would check it off and write the land all the way down. But oftentimes then you miss looking at the questions and using your judgment on and right. answering it, right? Yep. It happens all the time. Right. Especially, again, when you think about workload compression, you're doing it even faster and more often you're missing that opportunity uh -huh. to do the right planning. Right. Well, it gets back to the 28 work papers last year thing mm -hmm. you brought up earlier. Yeah, that's the flip side of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I overwork on one side, I underwork on the other. Right. All right, we're going to display on the bottom of the screen our first CPE code for this session. So uh, just take note of this, it's a three digit number. If you're planning on collecting CPE credit for this session, you'll need to record this code and then there will be two additional ones later in the session. So I'd like to continue our conversation with, with some of these pain points and bring in the people factor in addition to the, the work paper and the, the work uh, process factor. So when we're talking about working not only with um, our staff on uh, on, on these types of projects, but also with the clients, what kind of pain points are we running into there? Um, <clears throat> you know, as we're doing this, it's reminding me the whole process that our firm would go through. And, and, and you think about the old way of doing it, you know, you, 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 you contact the client, well, you know, you prepare your engagement letter, you send that to him, you get that. But you have a lot of communications with the client today, probably through email primarily, mm -hmm. right? And then, then you get the data from them and you, and you drop it in your trial balance and then you have, you know, maybe you have review questions and you're going to ask interrogatories of the client. You send that out or you physically go out there to, to ask the questions, you know, face to face. And, and um, it's a very, you know, it, the process is very inefficient. Right. So I know I, I spent some time earlier this week with, uh, with Al Anderson. Um, and many of you know uh, who Al is. Uh, he, um, he's well, former director of assurance at RSM, which is the fifth largest uh, firm in the in the nation, and spent about 10 years as a as a vice president with the ASCPA. Now consults with uh, with firms all over the country on the assurance side. And Al's been um, very involved, um, helping figure out you know how we automate, how this space gets automated. Al pointed out to me that I didn't check his math, I wouldn't know how to do that, but Al pointed out to me that there are over 750 possible combinations of paragraphs that could go into a PCR engagement letter. First of all, you have three. One's, one's, one's a pr pr uh, preparation, one's a, one's a comp, one's a review. Then you have comparative and non-comparative, and you have <clears throat> gap and not, you have disclosures and not. You have all of these different combinations, and just the amount of time that some junior, probably, probably the worst person to have to do that, but that's who does it, has to sit and figure out, uh, we're going to do one of two things, either Sally or we're going to try and figure out what it's, what it's going to be. So why can't that just be, odd? we know the answers to all of those things. So if, you know, applying good, solid, cloud-based logic to that, answering a bunch of questions, and then building an engagement letter that you know is correct, that follows whatever the current guidance is, because the guidance is current as of today, 
not as of the last thing that was printed in the binder that happens to be in your library. Um, I think that's that, that's a that, it's a small <coughs> example, but a huge example. Well, it was one of the impetuses of On Point PCR in the first place was simply looking at what what is out there today. How are firms tackling that situation today? And again, it's a lot of well, we we went through our engagement acceptance, our checklists, and then comparing what that says to what's actually in the letter. And it's manual, it's, it's reconciling manually, and so that, that's a significant part of what on-point PCR is essentially built to, uh, to, to resolve, among other things, I should right. say. I mean, it resolves a lot of issues. And going back to like the communications piece, if you think about all the emails that you send out to the client for requesting that prepared by client information, you, get, you send it out in an email, so you've gone out of your engagement software already, right. no matter what you're using. Right. You send that to the client, they send it back, then you take that email, you print or you, you know, transfer it to your portal or your, your file cabinet, and then get it into the engagement software, into the work papers where you want it. How many steps did that take? I had a number of conversations at the Digital CPA Conference earlier this week where I simply just asked questions around, what, you know, what, what are some of the challenges that you have in terms of interacting with clients? And I think the thing that, that seemed to be a resonating, a resigna resonating uh, theme from people is inevitably I send an email to a client and then they say, well, I already sent that to you. And there's just the egg on the face moment that, that you have when you uh, realize, oh, yeah, I found it in my email. Sorry about that. And how does that make you look with your clients, you know? Right. There's no internal check and balance to make sure that it actually happened. Yeah. And you're that right. That came up several times in conversations that I had at the conference. Sure. So um, I'm assuming that, uh, that there is a solution for pain points like this. You mentioned on point PCR and I'd like to at least talk a little bit about what that is and why why it's a, why there is a technology solution and why it would work. Sure. Um, so on point PCR since I mentioned it it's uh, it is specifically built for prep comp and review um, engagements hence the name on point PCR. And uh, it's uh, it is a collaboration of cpa.com with AICPA, who provides a methodology, and Caseware, who provides a platform through Caseware Cloud. And uh, it's really when, when looking at why was it built, kind of what is the uh, background behind it, um, much of that is around um, looking at what the market needs are. What, what does the profession need? How is the profession currently handling uh, prep, comp, and review work? And uh, we kind of touched upon a little bit earlier, but uh, the, the tools and the systems that are out there today are really geared for being able to scale up to the largest of audits that are out there. And whereas that's great and there are a lot of auditing firms out there, there are roughly 19,000 firms who provide assurance services that don't go all the way to the audit level. And they're just a pretty big void for that group of firms. Well, I think, then you, you know, if you also look at um, these different pain points, right, the communication with the client, the inefficiencies of the current procedures that you're already doing, the, the overworking to be compliant for peer review, all these pain points, you know, then you look at integrating technology, how can we better utilize technology to get to where we need to be and help the firms out? Right. And that's really, I think, the, the impetus for PCR. So, yeah. Carl, when we were talking earlier about the, about the NA and the long yeah, right. line and things, you, you have now a a cloud-based system that is, by definition, always up to date to current standards, and so we have the methods, the methodology part. When I answer the a particular question, say for example, type of organization, corporation, all of the answer, all of the questions that would relate to. Um, to partnerships or LLCs or whatever would would they just disappear? I no longer have to do NA NA NA. And if I go back and say, oh, it wasn't a corporation, I guess I guess it's uh, it wasn't a C corp, it was an S corp. So I go back and change that answer. Now all those questions come back. So, you know, oh, you have to go back. You have to answer these now because now they're appropriate. Right. And that's a that's a really big thing because we don't, as a rule. Um, many of those, it's not a rule, I should say that, but many of those questionnaires are filled out by entry-level staff that are doing what seems in the firm to be the lowest level of work. Um, but we still have 
this responsibility to to uh, exercise due professional care, whatever that means. Right. Right. So then a guided engagement type of methodology and system answers that a lot of those pain points and deals right. with a lot of those issues, right? When you start with, and you mentioned earlier, client acceptance, which is where it starts, and you guys have all gone through the demos, you know, as you go through that client acceptance, it starts asking the questions. One, it's already creating all the checklists that you thought, you know, that you were creating under the old system, but it's doing it automatically for you. You answer that it's an S Corp or whatever it is, it's gonna change some of the questions. And then you say, you know what, this is going to be a uh, compilation without footnotes, or it's going to be a compilation that is not GAP or something like that, right? It's gonna ask you and prompt the questions. And so it helps that young person with the questions coming right in at the right time, the appropriate time, right? right. Their mind's not gonna go somewhere else and say, I need to go do this. Right. It's gonna keep them focused. Yeah. So it, when they've filled that form out and they've said this is a compilation and it's a compilation without disclosures, and then the partner comes back and says, by the way, this is a review. And they go, okay, so it's a right. review. And then the system jumps up and says, well, whoa, whoa. Well, yeah. well, we don't do reviews without disclosures. Right, you know, exactly. That, that's that's right. a professional no-no. So right. now we need to go back and fix that. Right. But, right. but in lower-level staff, they wouldn't necessarily see that or catch that. Exactly. And so having it put right in their face, um, the way I think of it is it's, it's putting guardrails around the process. Um, it doesn't replace the need for a firm to do appropriate due diligence around making sure that they're compliant with standards, but it does kind of solve one facet of that. Um, and it does it in a way where um, if it is lower level staff, um, there's just far fewer situations where um, something that was just um, completely um, obviously done by uh, a newer staff where it would be just problems cropping up throughout where a reviewer is really kind of inundated to some extent with having to, to uh, go back and really almost redo the work to some extent. Right, right. Okay, so, so we had a little teaser about on point PCR, and we'd like to show you a little, in our commercial break a little bit of a visual about the process, and then we're going to come back and uh, share the second CPE code with you, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the types of pain points that you may be experiencing and um, uh, some real life examples as well. So, time for a quick break. Today, many preparation, compilation, and review engagements take longer than necessary manually building out the file and determining which procedures apply just to meet minimum compliance standards, leaving little time for value-added services for clients. OnPoint PCR is designed to resolve these issues by guiding you through a series of interactive steps, creating tailored engagements for your clients. Developed by CPA.com and AICPA and hosted on the Caseware Cloud SE platform, OnPoint PCR is custom built for firms to enhance engagement quality and efficiency. The central feature that enables this is Guided Engagements. Guided Engagements provides a step-by-step -step pathway through your engagements while automating tasks from the engagement letter to the financial statements. OnPoint PCR has guidance and methodology built in and will dynamically scale in complexity in response to the information you provide adjusting the engagement to meet your client's specific needs. OnPoint PCR, a smarter way to do preparation, compilation, and reviews. To sign up for a personalized product demo or register for an upcoming webinar, go to cpa.com forward slash OnPoint PCR. All right, we're back, and at the bottom of your screen, you should see our second CPE code for this session, so be sure to write that down along with the first one you got, and there'll be one more before the end of the session that you'll need in order to get your uh, continuing education credit. So um, we talked about a lot of different things in the first segment of this session, and one of the things that came up was the concept of peer review, and we just kind of shot right over that. So I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper at, um, into where this whole process comes into play with peer review. Can I jump into that real quick? Sure. sure. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you have your three-year cycle, right, for peer review, and every every year, you know, you have to send in your engagements and in their list and all that, and they're going to pull and choose. And, you know, we we're going to talk a little bit about you know overworking uh, the the compilation, the preparation, or even the review, <clears throat> and, and just to be compliant. And 
I know that's what we did in our firm. I mean, we would, you know, I, even on a compilation, we would have so much documentation that you didn't need to have. On a review, we'd do more than we really needed to do just to be compliant. And, uh, you know, I think that personally, this is the biggest pain point that firms have today, is that anxiety they have about peer review and being compliant right. and doing it right. Everybody wants to do it right and then staying up to date with standards. Yeah. And we, we conflate right with more. Yeah, and right. sometimes <laughs> right is less. In a compilation, right oh. is less. Yes, yes. I agree with that. We, we had an individual <clears throat> at one time who, was, uh, who, we, who we brought in who was very experienced within the a and side of practice. And when, when she saw what we were doing on a compilation, she says, oh, you don't need to do that. Why do you, you know, get this out of the file. You shouldn't have this in right. there. And so we were overworking with, based out of fear. Right. Well, part of, part of the reason I think overworking just happens naturally is we talked <clears throat> about what is the traditional way people approach these engagements. And I've heard in you know, talking to, to firms about what they're using, people generally have good things, positive things to say about the guidance from CCH, you know, PPC guidance and right. so forth. It's high quality. But the challenge is there's so much information and then you combine that with the same as last year mentality, and it's just there, there's so much there that a firm just looks at the procedures and says, well, let's just make sure we do this. And they're, they're not really necessarily reconciling the, the work that they're doing back to what the actual standards say they should be doing. Right. I, you know, one of the uh, things that came out of our audit quality initiatives that we had, AICPA, uh, especially on the audit side, but it, it filters down to right. comps reviews as well, is the... Um, not overuse, but the uh, the misuse or the inaccurate use of third-party practice aids, right? Mm -hmm. We're not using those practice aids properly. As good as they are, right. firms are not really using them in the proper manner. And it, it's because of the accessibility, because they're, even while they are now electronic, they're not easily accessible, and they're they're not they're not all in the same place, and they're they're not smart. I mean, right. we don't, you've got to know what you're, what you're looking for. You have to have that experience yeah. that, right. that the young exactly. people don't have. So what concerns me is this, this, on this overworking thing is, number one, we, we're doing more than we need to do. And the reason we're doing that is we want to make sure we're passing peer review. And, I mean, we went through all of our peer reviews from the very first to the beginning. I don't remember ever any of our peer reviewers saying, you did too much work there. I mean, I just, they, they didn't, and, you know, they may now a little bit more, but I don't, I don't think so. I think right. the, the problem is usually on the other side. What? So it's costing us money. Right. It's costing, it's either costing us money or the client money or both. And the, you know, the, the, the other side of this that I worry about is if we're, you know, if we're doing, if we're doing a comp and we've done a bunch of work on AR, for example, um, maybe more than we should have. We end up with some sort of a dispute. We end up in, in court and we say, they say, well, what did you do with inventory? And your answer is, it's a compilation. I don't need to do anything with inventory. <clears throat> say, yeah, but you did all of this for, for accounts receivable. So if you're exercising due professional care, which is, whether regardless of what we put in the engagement letter, we don't right. get rid of that. Right. So right. if you're exercising that due professional care, why was it this standard over here and not this standard over here? Right. And judges and juries don't understand that. So. Right, and that dovetails right into, as you guys know, I, I go around the country meeting with small firms all around right. the country, and we talked about, I was in Tennessee <laughs> last week, and we talked about uh, on-point PCR. And, and there was a number of people who were not aware of it at all and what it right. could do. And there was an audit partner uh, with a firm in Tennessee, and she goes, oh, my gosh, we need to pull this product into our firm so that our young staff are not auditing our compilations and reviews. They're actually right. preparing a comp and a review mm -hmm. in the proper manner. Yep, and, and it's not just the same as last year in terms of why they're doing it that way either. I think um, the number one overwhelming fear that I hear from people is, is peer review. It's the mo number one motivator, I should say. What is it that makes them do the things that they do in the first place? And same as last year, is really born out of that fear. I don't want to ma make any mistakes here in terms of what I'm doing, but in the process, I think mistakes are being made because of it. Right, you, you know, you, you need all the components of a good quality control system. A product like 
Well, your engagement software is part of your quality control system, but a product that really keeps you within the boundaries of the standards and, and on top of what's happening. If the standard changes next month, you're, you know, like with on-point PCR, you're going to be up to date with that new standard. Right, the right? language itself changes. That seems to be one of the things you look at, at yeah. how, what the state, um, what the states say as they're um, overseeing peer review, and that's one of the things that comes out of their reports is failure to document properly right. and failure to report, you know, with the appropriate language. And you're right, with on-point PCR, it's, you know, that process where at, as a nature of going through and answering questions about the entity and, and so on and so forth, um, it really starts very simple. It starts with just uh, acceptance and high level. And as things are actually answered, then additional documentation that applies in that situation is made available. So you just simply toggle from compilation to review, and all of a sudden the documentation that's required mm -hmm. changes as a result of that. And so it's, again, guardrails, right. really. Right. You know, the, the other part of putting, you have the, the trial balance, the, the, the math part, and you have the methodology and, you know, and, and the content. And beyond methodology, it's the actual mm -hmm. content. So I can, well, I promise you one thing, the, the, my least favorite thing in public accounting after TAT was, was going back to check to make sure that all of last year's footnote disclosures were still met the current requirements. Mm -hmm. Did someone, did they change the wording on a standard uh, least disclosure footnote? Is what I had last year, was right last year, I hope, but now I gotta go look that up and check to make sure it's right. Wouldn't technology, why shouldn't technology do that for me? Right. You know, and I mean, I, I understand that I still have the responsibility as a professional to determine that it's correct, but it would be a lot nicer to know automatically that that it is it is what's standard right now. I still still have responsibility, but it's what's standard right now. Right. I think a lot of small firms get away from doing footnotes because it takes time. They're hard. Right. Oh, absolutely. Right. So you know, I, with with technology, we should have an opportunity to go back to maybe providing more information to the stakeholders and to the owner of the business yep. by providing those footnotes and getting back to that in a time efficient manner. Yeah. And mostly, it's, it's fun to go into a client, deliver financial statements, and have them flip to the back and say, "Wow, these are really great footnotes. Thanks." Yeah. Or didn't you have that conversation? Yeah, yeah right. but, but I do think it's important to note, though, that, that a product like OnPoint PCR is part of your quality control system. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take care of everything. It's not all of it. It's not all of it. It's just part of it. But it's a significant part, and I think that addresses probably the biggest pain point that I know we had in our firm. Right. And it's... Oh, go ahead. I was simply going to say, we, we've talked a lot about compliance with standards, but the other standards that matter here are firm standards, and I think a lot of firms want to have mm. a standard way of do, going about sure. doing their work, right? And in order to do that in, a, in an effective manner, it makes sense to, to embed how the standard, the firm's standards are really applied in that kind of ecosystem where there are already uh, industry standards applied, professional standards applied to uh, the way that the work is done. So just thinking again through how on point PCR addresses that, that it allows for firms to be able to put in additional procedures as desired, but that it doesn't, again, uh, and not just that, but it also allows for um, during the review process to even see what's been changed. So the fact that certain procedures were added or even modified and seeing the language that was modified, what was the original language and what was the language that it was changed to, things like that. Right. right. So it seems to me like one of the um, pain points that that is not exactly being addressed, but we're, circ we're circling it from all different angles, is that is there a lack of oversight of staff? I mean, if, if we're starting at the staff level and we're getting the, you know, the NA crossouts or we're getting the, the Sally saying, you know, you did this last year, I'm going to do it again, and there's not a lot of thought going into that. Where is, is there another problem in the firm that's responsible for that happening? It, it depends on the size of the firm to some extent. So the, the problems that a sole practitioner or a really small firm would have in that regard are going to be different. But put, let's talk about a, a, a dynamic where there is at least a, somebody who prepares and somebody who reviews that work. So it doesn't really take a very large firm for that to happen. Mm -hmm. When 
a staff person is going through procedures, how do, number one, how do they feel as they're going through feeling like, I don't really know what the right answer here is? And so they're conflicted with that feeling of, I, I don't like not knowing the things I'm mm -hmm. supposed to be doing. They're also conflicted with, I don't really want to bo bother the partner or constantly feel like I have to ask questions to the partner or manager. So I think the unfortunate reality is it breeds this mentality that can <clears throat> bubble up, which is, well, this will simply get caught during the review process. Yeah. And so um, because of that line. mentality, yeah. right, because of that mentality, then <clears throat> you now have um, a, uh, an in-charge or a manager, whomever might be that first layer going through saying, whoa, what's going on here? What is all this? And they end up doing a lot more, just kind of redoing some of the work. And then there has to be a separate conversation to go back and tie in and help educate that lower level staff person. And it just, it, there's a lot of challenge with all of that. How do you see OnPoint then addressing that directly? So with OnPoint, uh, PCR specifically, <clears throat> it, it will allow a lower level staff person to go into a compilation, review, whatever the engagement is, and be able to start at a place where the questions that they're having to answer, if they aren't really sure what the answer is, if the answer that they provide is something that would just be completely in contradiction to what the standards require, on-point PCR will actually just raise its hand right away and say, whoa, 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 right. you can't do that. You, you have to, for instance, you have to have disclosures if you're going to be performing a review. So right. I think the whole guide, that's what I was kind of getting right. at, the guided, guided, the guided engagement. The, the guidance is there. Also. Right. So oh, you're you, know, right. you see what the standard is. Yeah. You know, here's inventory and here's the guidance. And, you're right. It's you pulling know, up that so you right. can read it. Eventually, when everything is pulled together, I click on guidance. It opens up. It, there's right. there's what it is. I you know I've got the I've got the guidance. I've got the disclosure. I've got you know all all of the all of the tools there. You yeah. were talking about the the staff accountant, uh, you know, trying to figure out what they were going to do. I would challenge everybody who's ever been that staff accountant. Carl, you too. Um, you know, how, how many of you have ever at some point just kind of took a deep breath and checked the box and said, God, I hope I get this through review? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. There you go. Right? Yeah, yeah very true. Very I right. worry about the people that said they didn't yeah, because right. they need an ethics course. All my friends are laughing at me right now. <laughs> So we're going to take another quick break, um, let's see a little bit more from CPA.com, and then we'll be back with your third CPE code for this session. On Point PCR, a smarter way to do preparation, compilation, and review engagements. On Point PCR helps support firms in performing high-quality engagements built with the latest AICPA technical guidance and methodology. OnPoint PCR is built on a premium cloud platform backed by Caseware's 30 plus years supporting the accounting profession and developed by CPA.com, your primary source for taking the complexity out of moving your firm to the digital arena. Transform your engagements and unlock your firm's capacity. Visit us at cpa.com forward slash on point PCR or call us today 1-855-855-5CPA. To sign up for a personalized product demo or register for an upcoming webinar, go to cpa.com forward slash on point PCR. Hello and welcome back and we have your third CPE code available on the bottom of the screen right now so be sure to write that down and save that with the other two that you got in this session and then at the end of the day you can uh, go to our CPE option on the top menu and uh, record all your codes for the sessions you attended today and get your certificates. So as we talk a little bit more about the PCR process um, I think we want to uh, consider a little bit about what the client expectations are when, um, when we as accountants are providing these uh, compilations or reviews or audits and um, and coming back to them with here's your final you know what what are what are the clients expecting when we come to them at the end of the job? Accuracy, timeliness, right? And, 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 and quality information that they can, you know, but they expect, they have this expectation that what you provide them 
is correct. You've looked at it. Even if it's a compilation, not supposed to be any assurance on it, or let's say it's a review, that you've done a certain amount of work, but they expect that to be uh, accurate. I mean, I think that's the biggest point. I think that, that certainly is, is um, almost a given. That, that, hey, you know, we've engaged you in this uh, process because we trust that you will be accurate and that you will do your due diligence. Um, I think expectations also throughout the process are also, it, it's, it's worth noting too, simply because we, you know, there, there's an expectation that the firm will ask the right questions as they need to, get the information that they need, um, and you know, we talked about the, the PBC list that lives in Excel, seems like it's lived there forever. Um, and this is another one of those areas where with client expectations, um, where on-point PCR, just thinking about how that handles the client and accountant relationship, how even through procedures and through uh, the steps in the process, if something requires a provided by client document, mm -hmm. it's embedded right into where that procedure takes place. So it's just a matter of saying, okay, let me go out and I'll send out a query for the client to provide that. Right. But if I could jump in with, you know, if you think right. about the old style of doing things, right? You have yeah. your Excel spreadsheets, you have your, 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 um, you know, your, your, your audit, I shouldn't say audit, your comp review checklist and things that you have, yes. and you try to mash those together ultimately, there's opportunities to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. and, but, and your client doesn't know that you have all these opportunities. Whether you're emailing them, getting it back, there could be a mistake that you make there in translating that information into the system. Um, you, you know, today we have the technology, we might as well have something that actually helps us provide that accuracy and that we don't miss that. You know, it's interesting to me, this, this, whole, uh, this whole ethics issue when it when it comes to the part of it's you know around peer review but but the bigger thing is you know ethics are by nature principles based not rules based right. laws are rules based laws are 65 miles an hour ethics are a reasonable speed based on the conditions you know that that sort of thing so we have a responsibility to exercise due professional care we have a responsibility to, to know that when we accept uh, an engagement that we have a, an adequate understanding of the nature of the client's business. You're right. And how do we, how do, we do that? I mean, we do because I've been practicing for a long time. Yeah, I know, Bob, you know, that, you know, so I've got that. But how do we document that? So your client acceptance, the very first thing you talked about today, client acceptance should walk you through that, right? Exactly. And, and oftentimes, because we don't have a guided system, we don't do that as well as we should. Yeah. Is this the, so the first question is, is this a recurring engagement or a first-year engagement? So that changes everything, yeah. you know, because, because retention of a client has a much lower standard than acceptance of a client. I'm not sure it should, but it, yeah, yeah. It, it does. What about having the expertise? We don't always think, we think, oh, it's a new client, we're just right. gonna pick them up and work on yeah. them. And, and a formal client acceptance process mm -hmm. will guide you through and make you think, do I really have the expertise right. to perform this engagement? Yeah. And, the, and the expertise is <coughs> that I know the difference between a debit and a credit. You know? <laughs> I would add to you that, the, uh, and this goes to the expertise, that at the end of the day, what we're trying to instill is confidence in right. the client and in the right. investors and that mm -hmm. company. And it's not like we haven't been doing that for 100 years, but it's just, it's been hard. And we've got issues with some of the, the ways things have been done in the past. Right? Well, we just want, we want to stay ahead of it. You know, we have, we have this enviable position of being the most trusted profession, but we have to cherish that, and polish it, and, and, and keep it, you know, uh, um, celebrate it and keep it at the forefront of the profession because it can go away. I mean, if we're not careful, it can go away. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm big on this whole idea of, you know, ethical behavior. We have an ethical re responsibility to properly supervise our staff. So, I mean, if we, if we use a tool like uh, on point PCR, and there are other there are other kinds of tools for other parts of our practice that do the same sorts of things. Uh, I'm more interested in the in getting the solution than I am of you you know thinking that this is the answer to all of your all of your woes. But um, if if we have something that that f forces us to supervise our staff by 
not allowing them to write NA and answer the questions and alarm, you know, and alarm if they, you know, if the questions don't align. Right. I, I, I was going to say, I, I would also say there's, an, there's a responsibility to the client as well when you start talking about ethics. How many firms out there have clients that email them sensitive documentation, social security numbers, bank account numbers, things like that. How about this, all of them. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and, but how many firms are, are taking a proactive approach to saying you really shouldn't be doing that, here's a tool or here's a process that we should be using that makes sure that the information that we send back and forth is kept secure and, it, and is essentially protecting you. Now, you can't care more about your clients confidentiality or, or um, uh, data than they do to some extent. So if they're going to send it that way, they are. Mm -hmm. but, but leveraging tools that will keep things secure is it's really paramount, I think, to the, su to the success or to the responsibility of the practitioner. You should be leading down that path of saying we should be using uh, secured tools. And that's um, you know, in terms of what's embedded with an on-point PCR, which I mentioned before, those are embedded right through a secured uh, portal channel. Right. Yeah. And we haven't even talked about the, the need to make sure that you have an integrated solution that not only guides that young practitioner through the process of the engagement, right. but also integrates your kind of a, a workflow mm -hmm. process, because I believe that's built into on-point PCR as it relates to the engagements that they're there, including then the process of the review system, the review part of it. Right, well, it's, it's, it's the review system. It's also, uh, if you have queried a client for information, having <coughs> a systematic uh, way that simply says, hey, we're, you were waiting on the client for this information right now, or something is, is in review, and so the reviewer is able to go through and, and uh, as necessary, make edits, make changes, <coughs> see the things that were changed from the original, and simply have the, the status of the engagement as a result of the work that's being done, no extra steps somewhere else having to check a, a box or having to indicate this is where we are in the engagement, but simply as part of the process built right in. As the, as the roadmap on, on this product and, and basically these kinds of products but, um, for PCR is that as the roadmap comes along and you, know, you begin to roll out specialty areas, nonprofits and things like that, that, that require you know, a kind of a separate, a specialized work stream, that's hard for firms to do, but when you can, when you can take that specialized knowledge and deliver it in a, less, I was gonna say painless, it's not painless, it's a less painful, uh, you know, in a less painful way, um, you've really accomplished something. And yeah. this is more, more now than any other time, this is when more firms are starting to look at how can I specialize, how can I build my practice around <laughs> a niche of some kind. So, yeah, interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Every other profession has done this. Right. I, mean, oh, the, the, I mean, whatever, is a realtor or a doctor, I mean, all sorts of things. When I go to my doctor, they ask questions on the, you know, on the computer and the computer guides them. It's, it's not, it doesn't take away their judgment, but it certainly helps narrow things. Right. Right. And you don't right. have to answer the same question to everyone who walks in the door of the doctor's office. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, this leads me to one other question about this process, which I think could be particularly relevant to our listeners, because we have a lot of small firms <coughs> who are paying attention, um, would an automated service, an auto automated product that helps with the PCR process, enable smaller firms to get more involved in the audit process, whereas before maybe they thought it was too big a thing for them to do? Well, there's a fear. They still have to get over some of the fear of peer review, I think, um, because no matter how good the systems are, <coughs> and they can see you know, demos of, of different technology that's out there, there still is an emotional leap of faith, I think, that has to happen yeah. in order for that to, to be the case. But to, beyond that point, yeah, there's definitely um, some opportunity for firms who maybe have shied away from even reviews. Maybe uh, I've talked to plenty who say <laughs> we're only going to really get into compilations. And um, there's certainly an opportunity to get involved and to do so in a way where you're not going to feel like you're taking on more than you can handle. It does okay. provide that opportunity, absolutely. Yeah. All right, excellent. So we have uh, our third uh, CPE code has not been displayed yet, so we're gonna display that right now. This is the third code for this session. It goes with the other two you got before. Um, and then, uh, so make sure you write that down. We're gonna wrap this session up. I wanna thank all three of you for sharing ideas in this session. It was super. 
Um, you will not want to miss the next session, which is on the generational gap, and we have some interesting members of various generations to share their insights with you in that session. And one more request from the back room. I'm hearing that if you have been with us for more than a couple hours and have not refreshed your screen, we would like you to do that right now. Just hit a refresh, and, uh, and we'll be back with you at the top of the hour. Thank you very much.